Hey, I've got a show rec for you. This month, the Wisconsin Chamber Orchestra on January 26th at 7.30 p.m. will perform Norwegian Fantasy. Ukrainian violinist Vladislava Luchenko will make her debut at the Capitol Theater playing the Eduardo Lalo piece. And gotta say, Luchenko will perform on a violin from the year 1710. Tickets are online at overture.org slash WCO. Today on CityCast Madison. It's the Friday News Roundup. This week, I'm joined by Madison Minutes editor Haley Sperling and Cap Times food editor Lindsay Christians. Three local businesses snag nominations in the Oscars of food. Two women are running to be Dane County's next leader. And did you know there were Nazis on the UW-Whitewater campus this week? Friends, we're going to talk all about it. It's Friday, January 26th. I'm Molly Stentz, and here's what Madison's talking about. Welcome to the Friday News Roundup. Joining me today is our very own newsletter editor, Haley Sperling. Hello. Hello, hello. Bianca Martin is on assignment. And we have a very special guest with us this week. Hey, it's the Cap Times food editor, Lindsay Christians. Hello, Molly. Hey, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me. So you've got some very cool food news for us this week. It's the Oscars of food. (laughs) It is the Oscars of food. Yeah, the James Beard Foundation's 2024 semifinalist list, which is the long list, dropped. And I got to call some people and tell them that they were on it. You got to inform them? Like you were the publisher's clearinghouse with, no, not the actual check. Just the- <laughs> <laughs> I just got the press release early. <laughs> so uh-huh. I, got, I got the press release and I was like, I don't know if they know this yet. So I called and sure enough, several of them did not. And a couple of them cried. <laughs> oh, it was really wow. great. I love that. That's so fun. I love when you get to like accidentally break news and it's good news and it's beautiful. I won't ask who cried, but I love picturing this. <laughs> <laughs> it was really sweet. It was really an exciting morning. Yeah. And so Mint Mark is on the list. Mint Mark on the list again. Best chef yep. of the Midwest. was. That probably wasn't a surprise. Not a big one. I think... I think Midmark, uh, when I called uh, Chef Sean Farr about that, he was one who I was like, he's been through this before because he was on the list in 2020. He said some similar things to then where he said, like, we don't pursue awards like this, but they are always such a wonderful recognition because you're you're getting attention for your work on a national level. And that's always really exciting for a lot of these chefs who, you know, they kind of put their head down and they do the work. And there's so much day to day that goes into running a successful restaurant that, having something like this can kind of make you look up and just take stock of what you've built. And I think that's very true for Sean. Um, He had a really busy 2023 getting ready to open the new Mint Mark and also opening Hank's next to the Muskie. Um, But he was just, he was thrilled. Um, I think this means a lot. And especially as they're moving into the new space, some people have been nervous about losing some essential parts of Mint Mark's character. And he hopes that this will be, you know, a a way of helping them feel less nervous about that, that it's going to be a good move. We want to know about the wallpaper. Or is it just me? (laughs) Definitely the wallpaper. It's so gorgeous in there. I'm excited. I'm excited for the new spot. That'll be so good. Sean is on the list with some chefs from the Milwaukee area, including Kyle Null from Birch, um, Dan Jacobs and Dan Van Wright from Esterev. They also own Dan Dan in Milwaukee. Gregory Leon from Amalinda is on the list for Outstanding Restaurant, which is a national category. Best Chef Midwest being a regional category. The Midwest in this case, in the terms of the James Beard Awards, is Minnesota, Wisconsin, South Dakota, North Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri, Kansas. So we are not in a category with Illinois or Chicago. Interesting. Which is interesting, right? Ohio and Michigan are Great Lakes. I'm fine with that. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Chicago tends to dominate. So, you know, if yeah. you're Cincinnati or Detroit, like, good luck. And it dominates for reasons, right? There's, it's a bigger city and there's a lot of amazing chefs there. But Well, and that's the cool thing, you know, to have some Madison pride is like we're up against cities 
many times our size and we hold our own. We do. Yeah. We do all right. You know, that's we, pretty cool. We really do. Yeah. Hey, I also saw Pastor and Plenty got a nod on this list for outstanding hospitality. I think this is such an interesting inclusion on this list because I think in previous iterations of the James Beard Awards, when we talked about hospitality in terms of, you know, what that meant in restaurant culture, it was like 11 Madison Park, right? It's like per se or the French high market where end. you walk in. Yes, high end where you walk in and it's, there's this exceptional care taken to like every part of your experience where there's a lot of waiters taking care of you and and you feel very sort of seen and comforted and made to like you're brought into this lovely rarefied space. The way that Pasture and Plenty embodies hospitality, they have made themselves sort of this center and and of a community, but also this force pushing that community forward. Um, so they do like cooking programs with Black youth. They do pop ups with um, like immigrant entrepreneurs. They have this P and P make shop where they've brought in like women of color and and um, people who are like otherwise would be like very undercapitalized or like looking for other sources of funding outside of traditional bank loans. And she's brought them into the space where they can make tortillas and ice cream. And then she gets to sell those things in her shop. But she's She's really, Christy McKenzie, I should say. Christy McKenzie is the owner of Pasture and Plenty. She start, started it as a meal kit service in like 2016, 2017, and has really grown it into this place that really walks the walk in a city where I think a lot of people talk about these kinds of things. I'm really happy for them. Christy was stunned when I reached her yesterday. She was super shocked and just thrilled, again, for this like national recognition for the work that they do here in Madison. Yeah, and then we also had a local chocolatier on the list this year. Yeah. So pastry chef and baker, outstanding pastry chef and baker is one where it could be like someone who's working in a high-end restaurant and doing pastry, or it could be a chocolatier, which is what Siavada Adari is. She founded her like little nano factory of Cocova in, I think, 2016 or so. And then she moved it to the Marling a couple of years later. That's where her shop is right now. One thing to note for folks who want to like get those chocolates, it's open from 12 to 6 on Saturday and Sunday and that's it. Wow. So so get in there and get them. <laughs> they're really they're beautiful chocolates. Uh she's all about like the the fillings and the flavors inside. They're just gorgeous. And her fruit caramels are one thing that she's really known for. She's got like a passion fruit mango caramel. It's gorgeous. Um, she'll sometimes do pop-ups at Overture. You'll see her there. But the thing that's really cool also about Vada is that she is, she's is she been raising funds to uh, move to a new building so that she can expand her operations and also so that she can provide space for you know other entrepreneurs who you know she wants to help train in the art of chocolate making and also give opportunities to. Very cool. Yeah. So I know we can't like make you take bets or anything <laughs> on who's going to win, but anything you're looking for? So I actually, I really think about the gamification of the James Beard Awards a lot. Like I think about it a lot. And I I have to say, as, mu- as thrilled as I am to see Sean on the list, I don't think another Madison chef will take it home for a little while because Itaru and Andrew took it home last year for Fairchild. And I would imagine that it will be a little while before Wisconsin takes home Best Chef Midwest. We had also Dane Baldwin the year before uh, out of Milwaukee. So I bet like we see some love to the Twin Cities or St. Louis or somewhere like that uh, for Best Chef Midwest. I also think being on that long list is not nothing. I think, I mean, Jamie Jamie Brown Subasame from Ahan was on for Emerging Chef last year and they had this huge bump of you know, people coming there so that they were able to make a move to a larger space. That's amazing, right? Yeah. So just the recognition from being on that long list, I think, makes a difference. Yeah, that's huge. And and like you said, too, like the moves that people have been able to make after this. I just actually went to Ahan's new space for the first time. And I, 
I was honestly a little bit I, happy for the business that they can move and grow and expand in the way that they should. But also I was like, Ahan used to be located literally like right down the street from where I live. So I was like bummed that they were leaving. But the new space is so nice and it's so beautiful. And I'm happy for them, happy to see them grow. And I feel the same way about like Mint Mark, right? You know, like just kind of down the street the other way. Um, and now they're moving just slightly a little bit farther away, but it'll be hopefully bigger and better than before. And now Cocova, hopefully moving to something bigger and better. Like I'm I'm seeing a trend here. Madison is uh Madison. This is leveling up, it seems like, in the food scene within within some recent years, it seems like. When you see all these wonderful restaurants, it always makes me want to travel as well, like and to see like counterparts in other cities. And I just I feel like having Madison be connected. That is so amazing. Road trip, road trip, road trip. All right. <laughs> all right. Future ideas. Lindsay, thank you so much for dropping by and giving us this news. We appreciate you. Thank you. Happy James Beard Week. Well, before we dive into any more news, let's take a quick break. It's January, folks. And in case you forgot, we live in Wisconsin. Although it's been an unusually warm winter, we still need to prepare for slippery and icy roads. Attorney Z Usman with Usman Law wants to remind you of some of the winter rules of the road to help keep you safe. So remember, accelerate and decelerate slowly. Don't follow any car too closely, avoid using cruise control, steer in the direction of a skid, and don't stop when going up a hill. If you are in an accident, call Attorney Z Usman. He's handled hundreds of insurance claims and can ensure you get everything you are owed. There are no upfront costs and no fee unless he is successful. Also, pro tip, don't negotiate with the insurance company on your own. Go visit madisonaccidentlawyer.com to schedule a free call with attorney Usman. Hey, Lee, we have other news in Madison this week. And what's been on my mind is our county executive race. So we saw a big endorsement this week. It feels kind of wild to be talking about it already, but here we are. So we should say the Dane County Executive, Joe Parisi, is retiring. And we caught up with him when he made the announcement. We'll link to that interview if anybody wants to catch that. Um, so he's retiring after a long time in just a few months. He's done. He's ready to do other things in life, as he told us. His wife's retired. So that leaves this big opening in Dane County for new leadership. So we have two front runners really in the race for county executive. So we should know that there will be a temporary leader of the county over the summer. And the county does all of the stuff that we, some of us may take for granted, right? Like they manage the airport. They manage our landfill. They manage a lot of the plowing, a lot of rural roads in the area. They manage lake health, you know, try to keep our water quality good. They own a lot of land and manage a lot of parks. Also the sheriff and the jail. Lots of things are, are done at the county level. And the county exec is the person leading all of that. And the zoo. And the zoo. We cannot forget the zoo. So it's a big opportunity. It doesn't happen very often. So who's running? We've got two candidates. Melissa Agard, who some of us remember when she was Melissa Sargent. She was on the Dane County Board for a while. She then got elected to the state assembly after the Act 10 protest. She was really active in the Act 10 protest at the state capitol, really kind of galvanized her interest in wanting to be involved in state politics. She was in the assembly and then got elected to the state senate. She represents the 16th Senate District, which is a lot of like Madison North Side, East Side. And she's really making this argument that She's got a ton of political experience, you know, and she's backed by the current county executive. Mm. She also, worth noting, has been a really strong advocate of worker rights and healthcare access and marijuana legalization. 
written a lot of the bills over the years. And she's up against Regina Vitiver, who is an alder on the Madison City Council. She's from Madison's District 5, which is the near west side, like University Regent Street area from Randall to Midvale. And she's a healthcare executive. So she's got a background, a PhD in cellular molecular biology from UW. And she oversees the chronic disease and cancer prevention programs for the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. And she's really making the argument that, hey, health and human needs, like that's a huge part of the county's budget. And that's my jam. That's what I do. That's my background. That's my expertise. Let me help the county on that. Now, We should also say that there's a third candidate who has filed to run, but who doesn't seem to be making much of an actual uh, run at it, and that's Robert Harlow. So it feels like it's a two-person race at this point between Melissa Agard and Regina Vitiver. And they're both very interesting, right? No, like you said, um, Melissa's definitely the political candidate like she has that politics background and you know when you were you're first talking about Regina I was just like okay yeah your experience is really interesting and I like I want you to stay in the job you have it sounds like that's a great (laughs) fit but also I am a huge fan of bringing outsiders into new spaces, right? Like bringing someone with a PhD in cellular and molecular biology into politics, because I think we get so stuck, especially like policy wise, you know, when we have the same politicians doing the same thing for decades and decades and decades. Um, And I think a fresh perspective would be really useful and really helpful. And like you mentioned, health and human services is a huge part of the county budget. I mean, we just had that whole, whole debacle about who's going to lead the whole health and human services department in the county. Uh, And this is, um, yeah, kind of an interesting angle on that. I am very interested with uh, Melissa Agard. Like, could she just legalize weed in uh, Dane County? Like, (laughs) could she do that? Um, Because that might win over a few other votes if she (laughs) she makes that a big part of her platform. Because, I mean, the way I really see her, I don't just want to say like the weed lady in the assembly, but like she's she's always pushing for uh, legalization um, on that end. And so, yeah, this is interesting. I'm very curious to see what these two have to say are some of the bigger challenges the county is facing, right? I feel like people kind of ignore the county, you know, like it's the stuff that you expect to get yeah. done. You know, like I said, it's you said it's the airport and landfill and the zoo. Um, but someone's got to feed the zoo animals, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh, it'll be interesting to see what issues they bring up here and bring some more attention to county rather than just Madison city politics. I'm really excited to see how that shakes out. Yeah. So we will keep an eye on that race for leadership. But man, another thing that was going on, speaking of lack of leadership, what the heck happened with Nazis coming to our area, Haley? Uh, Yeah, I like hate that this is the second time at least that I've had to talk about Nazis on the roundup in the very short time that I have been part of this news roundup. (laughs) Um, But it's important that we talk about these things, right? Because if we don't talk about them, then they're bound to happen again. Um, And essentially what happened in this case was... The night before the first day of classes, students at UW-Whitewater were faced with images of hate on campus. Um, A group of neo-Nazis rallied on campus. And I use the term rallied loosely because there were like four of them there. Like it was a very pathetic showing. You know, in Madison, a rally is dozens of people. But there were like four of these guys here. On campus, they were chanting, you know, weird phrases like we are everywhere and like there will be blood. So insinuating violence, insinuating that they have a presence Uh, and the group also used a like a strobe light to project a swastika onto a dorm, which is truly horrifying like that. 
that is just I I can't imagine like being a student at UW Whitewater. Um, and shout out really quickly to all of the student journalists at UW Whitewater on the Royal Purple because this is actually you know how I found out about this story was through student journalists who were covering it first and covering on the scene. Very yes. important. Yes. Um, and it's. It's frustrating. And like, you know, some of these students have said um, the situation has left them feeling very frustrated and very fearful for both obvious and, you know, kind of insidious reasons. Right. So members of this hate group, uh, they wore masks to cover their faces. And one student told local media that the situation was really troubling because, quote, I could be talking to someone and not know if they were outside last night or not. And like that really hit me, right? You know, because it's it's one thing to stand strongly in your convictions, uh, you know, and say something with your full chest, despite, you know, what the fact that what you're saying might be abhorrent and wrong and racist and anti-Semitic and all of all of these terrible things, but you're putting your name to it. Uh, and again, these people stood outside with face masks and then ran away before the cops showed up. So essentially UWPD responded to calls about the group. um, But by the time they showed up, they were gone. Uh, UW Whitewater's chancellor has come out condemning the situation very strongly. And they said that uh, the school has increased its police patrol on campus out of quote, an abundance of caution. Um, But also it's kind of necessary, right? Like there were literal Nazis on your campus. This is an issue. This isn't just a matter of being cautious. This is a matter of protecting your students because you didn't protect them to begin with. Um, and, you know, as, aside from fear, as as I've been alluding to, students and community members are really just frustrated because this event happened just two months after a very similar group of roughly two dozen neo-Nazis came to rally in Madison. If you remember that, the Blood Tribe yeah. came here again with their face masks, again with their flags and swastikas, you know, just trying to to terrorize our, our space, our community, and get a rise out of people. And that's That's ultimately what these groups want, right? They want to get a rise out of you. A lot of them are like serial lawsuit chasers. They want you to fight them, so they sue you, essentially. Um, And so that's why I think it's very important to tread lightly when talking about this subject, because I don't want to obviously incite violence. That's not why we're here. But it is important to have these conversations and make sure that people are aware of these situations that are happening, right? Because like I said at the beginning, like if we don't talk about this, history is only doomed to repeat itself. And I have some fears that, you know, situations like this are really only bound to get worse because of the bullseye that our state legislature has painted on DEI, especially within higher education. You know, like it it makes me fearful that students or faculty would have fears talking about these types of situations because they don't want to offend, you know, the overlords who are holding their paychecks in their hands, you know, being in in the state assembly. Um, so that that makes me nervous. It makes me really nervous um, with the precedents that we've set at the at the state level. Yeah, and as you mentioned, this is a freaking pattern. We saw yes. it. In Madison, we saw it in Watertown last yes. year. Now we're seeing it in Whitewater. And these are the things that we're hearing about, you know, that, right. that there are journalists there. There are people there with cell phones to capture and cover. I like you mentioned, you know, Watertown, this is it's becoming a pattern. And I, I'm curious if it has anything to do with the election. You know, is Wisconsin just a target these days? You know, is this... Is this related back to, you know, what's going to happen in November, you know, with our presidential election? Um, Why does this keep happening? Like, this is just kind of my general question. And I don't have an answer. Like, I really hate to I hate to think about what the future holds. But also, again, it's important that we have these conversations now so we don't run into these issues farther down the line. Or when we do, we're better prepared. Because, again, this is a situation where, like, Clearly, they weren't prepared. Um, Like, the cops got there too late. The same case in Madison. Like, people called the cops on the Nazis, but then the cops were like, well, we can't really do anything about that, which is 
fair, but also, I don't know. I don't really know. I don't have an answer for that one either. Like, what are the authorities supposed to do in this situation? Yeah. And as you mentioned, there is this hate crimes task force. Yes. But what's their charge and what what are what's the scope of their resources? What are they able to do? Are they coordinating with the feds? Is this a regional effort? Because as we're as we're talking about, it's it's a regional issue and a national issue. Exactly. Exactly. I hope that our hate crime task force with the limited time that they have left, the clock is ticking. It's only a 90 day task force. I hope that they come up with some answers or have resources, but we'll see. Um, I hope any Nazis out there stay away because you're bad. That's all I have to say on that. (laughs) In my nicest words, in my, my podcast appropriate words. (laughs) Thank you, Haley. Agreed. We never want to talk about Nazis on the Roundup, and yet here we are having to talk about them because they keep showing up. Here we are. We'll do it again, too. I'll call them out. I'll call them. I would love to call them out by name if we had them, you know? Uh, Out your Nazi friends. That's the moral of the story. Don't let people in your community get indoctrinated to these hate groups. And that starts with you. Starts with talking to your friends. Well said, Haley. It's important. Thank you, Haley. Well, this has been your Friday News Roundup with food news and county news and sadly, Nazi news. Please, folks, this we, we don't want this to be our beat. We don't want right. to be on the Nazi beat. Nobody wants this. Cut it out. All right. Thanks, Haley, for being here. Thank you, Molly, for having me and for providing the space for this conversation, all of our conversations. That's all for today here on CityCast Madison. I'm Molly Stenz, the executive producer and captain of this here podcast. And hey, if you ever want to learn more about the stories on our minds, we link to them in our show notes so you can read them for yourself. It takes a fantastic team to bring you this podcast every day. Bianca Martin is your host. Our producers are Alexandra McMahon, Lizzie Goldsmith, and AKL Moman. Haley Sperling is our newsletter editor. Catch her in your inbox each weekday morning. Our theme music is by the one and only Carl Christensen. And if you enjoyed today's show, Why not share this podcast with someone who shows up every day with love in their heart? We need you. See you back here Monday morning with more news from around the city. Bye.